just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. Godfather Part 3 is a fascinating beast. For years it has been maligned and misunderstood, but I do genuinely believe it adds a lot to the epic Godfather saga. In this video, I'm going to take a look back at the history and production of the film and then discuss why I think it is in fact an underrated combination. Francis Ford Coppola seemingly spent more time trying to get away from the Godfather series than he did making it. Coppola felt the first two films had told the complete saga of the Corleone family and continually turned down offers to make a part three. Undeterred, Paramount continually tried to come up with a script for part three, wanting to set the film in the 1970s, with studio president Michael Wesner writing an early treatment in which the CIA would align with the Mafia. A script also floated around written by screenwriter Alexander Jacobs which would be about Michael's son Anthony inheriting the crime empire. Paramount also pursued Richard Brooks to direct the film, but he declined. They also considered Michael Mann, Martin Scorsese and even Russian filmmaker Andrei Konchevolovsky. Ultimately, after especially bad returns on his films One From The Heart and The Cotton Club, Coppola once again decided to give in to big bad Paramount accepting one last hurrah in the Godfather directing chair. Coppola proposed titling the film The Death of Michael Corleone, but Paramount rejected that idea, feeling it removed any intrigue from the film. Early on, names such as John Travolta and Eric Roberts were considered to play Anthony Corleone in a Passing of the Torch movie. However, this idea did not last long, and by 1982 there was another script that surfaced written by Vincent Patrick, in which Michael would be killed in the opening scene and the rest of the film would focus not just on Anthony, but Michael's daughter as well. By 1988, original Godfather author Mario Puzo started working on another draft with fellow author Nicholas Gage. No, not him. Nicholas Gage. However, believe it or not, Nicholas Cage was at one point considered for a role in The Godfather Part 3, at the time begging his uncle Francis Ford Coppola for the chance to play Sonny's son Vincent. Cage believed he felt a little more similar to James Caan than Andy Garcia who was eventually cast. Hey, I'm always down for Nick Cage starring in anything, so who knows, maybe it could have made the film more memorable than it is with a lot of fans. What do you think? Coppola and Mario Puzo completed a final draft on May 10th 1989 and it would apparently contain almost none of the elements from the many scripts presented in the previous 12 years. Al Pacino accepted an offer of 5 million to return to his iconic role, however some sources say it was closer to 8. Robert Duval, who played Tom Hagen in the first two films, refused to return unless he was paid something similar to Al Pacino. The actor believed Pacino should get twice his salary, but not three or four times so he asked for a huge amount out of spite. Coppola decided to write Tom out of the screenplay, changing it so that he had died before the story began, replacing him with a similar character called BJ Harrison, played by George Hamilton. Coppola was reluctant to do this, saying the film felt incomplete without Robert Duval, and Duval himself went on to say he regretted the decision of turning down the role. Don't be so greedy next time, Rob. Of course Pacino should get a lot more than you. It's bloody Pacino. Bon voyage, motherfucker. To play the role of Michael's daughter Mary, now all grown up, Julia Roberts was the original choice, but dropped out early due to scheduling conflicts. Madonna expressed desire to play the part, but Coppola felt that she was too old. Winona Ryder ended up getting the role and even started filming, but had to drop out a few weeks in as she was filming Mermaids at the time and was exhausted. This is when one of the decisions that seemingly doomed The Godfather Part 3 was made. Coppola selected his daughter, Sophia, her performance in Godfather Part 3 went on to be heavily criticised, and she ended up having to read up about 20% of her dialogue after a disastrous early screening. And even after that, to this day her performance is incredibly derided among critics and fans. Sofia Coppola has gone on to say that she never actually wanted to be an actress and only accepted the role as a favour to her father. Some have suggested Sofia's involvement may have contributed to the Godfather 3's box office performance which started off strong but sharply declined. Sophia went on to win Worst Supporting Actress and Worst New Star at the 1990 Golden Raspberry Awards and the performance ended her acting career, although she did go on to appear in the independent film Inside Monkey Zetterland in 1992. 
I'll discuss Sophia's performance when we get to the review, but it does seem like this is perhaps one of the elements of The Godfather 3 fans just can't forgive even to this day. I don't know, I kind of feel a bit sorry for her, I've seen way worse performances, but I think anyone honest has to agree she was a bit out of her depth. Godfather Part 3 premiered in Beverly Hills on December 20th of 1990. Released worldwide on Christmas Day, the film grossed $136.9 million worldwide on a budget of $54 million. Despite not being nearly as acclaimed as the first two movies, The Godfather Part 3 was still nominated for seven Academy Awards, however it did not take any home, and was the only film in the trilogy not to win Best Picture, let alone anything else. To this day, there is a level of controversy around The Godfather 3, with some fans calling this movie the ultimate example of a third entry in a trilogy always being a disappointment. Coppola took action to remedy this for the film's 30th anniversary, delivering a recut of the movie now titled The Godfather Coda, The Death of Michael Corleone. The new version received a limited theatrical release on December 4th of 2020, followed by home digital releases on December 8th. The recut does not change a great deal, however it does include differences in the beginning and end of the film, with the ending being the most important. Coppola was very proud of the recut, saying this was the original film he and Mario Puzo had envisioned. Believe it or not, a fourth instalment in the Godfather saga was talked about in the years after part 3, but Coppola stated that once Mario Puzo passed away, he decided not to write it. The potential script would have apparently included Robert De Niro returning as Vito Corleone from the Godfather part 2, and Leonardo DiCaprio's name was also floated around to play a young Sonny Corleone. Andy Garcia was also rumoured to return, and he has since claimed the film's script was very nearly produced. The Godfather Part 3 picks up in 1979, 20 years after the end of The Godfather Part 2. Michael Corleone is now pushing 60 years old, and is racked with guilt over his years as a gangster, and he is attempting to legitimise his criminal empire. Michael is still estranged from Kay, played by Diane Keaton, and he has maintained a close relationship with his sister Connie, played by Talia Shire, as well as his children Anthony and Mary who are now grown up, played by Frank D'Ambrosio and Sofia Coppola. Michael also finds himself acting as a father figure to his nephew Vincent, played by Andy Garcia, who desires to take over the Corleone Empire and continue the legacy. When chaos erupts with a gangster by the name of Joey Sarza, played by Joe Mantegna, Michael finds himself once again pulled back into the crime world he so desperately desires to leave behind. Michael's emotional journey of redemption in The Godfather 3 is a fascinating watch. At the start of the movie, I find myself wondering whether Michael has really changed or if he's just acting out of guilt, trying to clean up his public image. You get the feeling that Michael's involvement in the church is simply to cover up the darkness in his soul. At the start of the movie, Kate still does not believe Michael has changed. She knows he loves their children and her, but she struggles to believe that the years and years of crime can be undone or that his ruthless heart has softened. In one of the early scenes, Michael tells his son Anthony, who wants to make it as a singer, that he should stick to academia. Anthony will not allow Michael to lecture him, and neither will Kay, and you get the feeling that there is resentment there. How dare Michael judge what anyone else wants to do with their life after what he has done with his own? Kay makes it clear that it's almost worse that Michael is now donating to all these good causes, because it's too little too late, and the fact Michael waited so long to do it after all of his bad actions makes it almost a mockery that this is now how he wants to live. But as the film goes on, slowly but surely, we are made very aware that there is indeed true regret in the soul of Michael, and his family starts to realise it too. That journey is incredibly powerful. Coppola doesn't expect us to immediately empathise with Michael, of course, the last time we as viewers saw him, he ordered the hit on his brother. But the movie does suggest that we as viewers can perhaps, possibly, forgive Michael. And that is the power of The Godfather 3, the idea that even the most terrible of actions are not black and white. There is always grey areas and people who commit terrible acts are very often not unredeemably evil themselves. But the film never lets Michael off the hook, even though he's on a journey towards possible forgiveness. Michael knows full well that his actions can never, and should never, be forgotten. For me, The Godfather 3 is the most human and reflective film of the series. It's about making sense of things, the passage of time, your own actions, the monumental decisions of the past, and trying to come out the other side of it in a place of self-awareness and forgiveness. In other words, it's about getting older and taking responsibility for the things you regret. I swear on the lives of my children.
give me a chance to redeem myself. And I will sin. No more. I enjoy seeing the older Michael Corleone, mainly because I'm a sucker for Al Pacino's 90s output to today. I like the seasoned Pacino. No longer the wide-eyed youthful gangster of Godfather 1 and Part 2, he's now a veteran. He understands the crime world fully and is full of regret. For me, Pacino became more striking and physical with his performances as he got older, and I love how, even when he's reserved in this film, you can feel so much through his physicality, facial expressions, and the way he communicates. I love the tender scenes between Michael and Kay. The first is in the hospital when there is still distance between them, but you can feel the love underneath. Kay isn't used to seeing Michael so vulnerable, and Michael tells her it's actually quite refreshing for him. And it's little moments like this that gradually convince Kay that Michael has changed. Then when Michael takes Kay for a drive in Sicily and they have a walk together, it's a scene that shows that peace is always possible, even for just a few moments and that Michael and Kay have a bond that can never be broken. Then there is the all-important conversation where Michael is completely honest, and after all these years lets Kay know that it wasn't a charade. He really has changed. You couldn't understand back in those days. I love my father. I swore I would never be a man like him, but I loved him, and he was in danger. What could I do? And then later, you were in danger. Our children were in danger. What could I do? And now I'm losing you. I lost you anyway. You're gone. And it was all for nothing. Such a poignant and honest display of regret and redemption. And when Kay breaks down, it shows the emotional toll that Michael's actions have taken on her. These quiet, introspective moments humanise Michael probably more than any other scenes in the series. This journey of redemption isn't a joke for Michael. It's true, and we know it when he passes the business down to Vincent. He's not happy at all about doing it. He knows he's setting up Vincent for a life of misery. Vincent is unable to see what Michael can, and that's something I think is discussed throughout the film. The contrast in generations. At Vincent's age, he cannot really comprehend why Michael is so sick of the life. But Michael knows full well, when Vincent is as old as him, he will probably feel exactly the same. It's the age-old idea of perspective. We can never truly see the world from someone's point of view until we get there ourselves. Andy Garcia brings a level of depth and nuance to the role of Vincent. You really do feel his love and affection for his uncle Michael, but also his naivety for this brutal world he is about to step into. He brings a lot of youth and passion to the film, constantly wanting to take revenge for whatever is done to the family. And Michael begs him to think things through, to not react with anger and hate every time. I want no further conflict with him. Will you tell him from me that he can live or he can die? Vincent, will you shut up? Coppola's direction is still just as masterful as it was in the first two films, just in a different way. Godfather 3 doesn't have the colossal scope and it isn't as grand as the first two, but instead it's unique, it's reflective, it's downbeat, it's honest, it's the culmination of everything that the family went through. I like that because it makes the film stand out. Instead of trying to reach the insane levels of the first two, which it was never going to do, the film took a different route and decided to take in everything that happened in those films and have the third one be more of an aftermath, showing the impact of it all and the attempt to move on. Coppola is still fantastic with colour, the compositions are just as beautiful as ever and create a sense of luxurious beauty. There's less of a focus on shadows, which were a huge part of The Godfather 1 and 2, and I think that's because Coppola is trying to bring Michael and his soul out of hiding creating a much more kinder and welcoming tone for the third movie. The use of Catholic iconography is constantly here, combined with a sombre score, so it all comes together to underscore Michael's existential crisis. The fantastic confession scene in which Michael bears his soul to a priest is my favourite part of the whole movie. It is so powerful and devastating. Pacino's performance is out of this world. After all that Michael has done and seen, you truly believe that being honest and confessing is the most difficult thing Michael has ever had to do. You get this real impression that this is the first time Michael has ever talked out loud about what he did to his brother. It's a monumental moment. I ordered the death of my brother. He injured me. I killed my mother's son. I killed my father's son. 
One of the main pieces of backlash The Godfather 3 receives is of course Sofia Coppola's performance. And I have to be honest, she's not very good. She doesn't really belong in a film of this scale. She's out of her depth when acting alongside people like Al Pacino and Andy Garcia. Only, only if you ask. What is this really for? Why are you doing this? Why am I doing this? Please, promise me. No. Obey me on this, Mary. No, Dad. It's a shame when Owner Ryder wasn't available because many fans have said this film would be improved 50% just by that. However, I do want to say I think Sophia looked a part. She looked like a movie star. However, her acting just wasn't up to it. I do think she has a few genuine scenes though, like when she asks Vincent whether her father did kill Fredo and Vincent lies to her. The way she asks the question is pretty earnest, so that scene was okay. The hero, he saved the family. Vincent. What? Did he kill his own brother? No. So those are all lies? Just stories, sweetheart. I also liked several of the romantic scenes with her and Vincent. I at least believe they were in love, but ultimately her performance just stands out like a sore thumb. And in a franchise of such magnitude, performances have got to be up there to compete with the elite. Do I think it's such a flaw that it ruins the film? No, but it's certainly one of the elements that doesn't stand up to the first two films. But The Godfather 3 for me manages to still be great because it's different and doesn't need to stand up to the first two in the same way. But I guess the acting is one element that has to be as good, and Sofia Coppola just doesn't cut it. I feel bad for her because as we know, she only did the film as a favour. It does seem to be that a lot of fans focus on her, when really they were probably only looking for someone to blame because they just didn't think a Godfather Part 3 was needed, and anything about it being not as good as the first two was going to be singled out. I do like what she represents though, which is one of the only things in Michael's life that is pure, and I think she has the effect she needs to, at a minimal level, largely due to Pacino and the other actors reacting to her in the right way. One of the scenes in The Godfather 3 that does stand up to the grand and epic set pieces of the first two movies is the culmination in which Michael and the family go to watch Anthony perform on stage. Michael is incredibly proud of his son and experiences joy watching him, but meanwhile someone is planning to attempt to assassinate him elsewhere in the building. For me this represents the fact that Michael can never escape the gangster life. It's looming over him, stalking him, constantly refusing to let him go. Michael thinks he's having a night of happiness and can finally come out of the other side and enjoy the success of his children. But someone's trying to kill him at the same time. I love how Coppola cuts between the wholesome family scene and the grim reality of Michael's past. The show that they are watching is epic, grand and operatic, spectacular, and neither Anthony nor Michael and his family or anyone involved in the show realise that this is not just a regular play. For us watching, it now represents Michael's reckoning. The scene is perfectly edited, fantastic camera angles, striking imagery, and you really feel a sense of stress and dread and worry for Michael. There's just an epic tension to this, and of course the overall culmination of the film that follows is devastating. If you haven't seen The Godfather Part 3, I would end the video here because I really don't want to spoil the ending for you. But it's an ending I just have to talk about, it's so important. So there are of course two endings to The Godfather Part 3 now that the 2020 cut of the film exists. The endings aren't incredibly different, I mean they both follow the accidental murder of Michael's daughter and his heartbreaking reaction, and then they flash forward to Michael as an old man. In the original ending, Michael passes away alone, but in the recut, he survives, doomed to live a long life with all the pain and regret on his shoulders. For me, the original ending is a blessed release for Michael, but the recut is simply savage. Coppola does not give Michael a way out, he condemns him to continually replay his actions over and over in his mind. The new ending is incredibly uncompromising. Michael doesn't reach his desired destination of forgiveness. He's now alone, he's lost everything, he's intensely lonely, with no one to turn to, and he has a shell of a man left to rot. It's heartbreaking stuff because we as an audience know that, despite everything, Michael at his heart is not a bad person. But his decisions have been bad, they've caused many deaths. Fredo, Apollonia, and now Mary, who was the final straw. Young, kind, innocent, the best of Michael. When she died, so did what was left of Michael's heart and soul. And while it is never said, I believe the exile we see Michael in at the end is self-imposed. 
he knows he has crossed the line and is now no longer deserving of redemption is seen as a devastating example of how simple images and gestures can be incredibly powerful. The culmination of everything we've seen in three epic films comes down to a broken man simply sat there alone and the impact of that hits you like a ton of bricks. What do you guys think of The Godfather Part 3? Do you agree it's underrated or are you someone who dislikes the film to this day? Please let me know in the comments below and please consider subscribing if you enjoy analysis and retrospectives on classic and cult films and I will see you guys in the next video.